Okay, so I think uh, it's a good time to start. So this talk is about successful and not yet successful optimization in Valgrin. So the first question you might ask is how do we classify the successful and the not successful? Uh, a colleague uh, at my work has said the successful is what I'm writing and the not successful are the ones that the others are writing. And no, in this case it is not that classification that I will use because I will speak about two optimizations that I did and one which has been committed in the SVN uh, repository and the other one not committed, not committed yet. So. The content, I will speak about two optimization, uh, the generalization and optimization of the massive execution tree concept. So uh, I don't know how many uh, uh, here were there at the talk of this morning where I've described the functionality of the X3. And here we will speak more about its internal implementation. And as, as uh, we have seen this morning, this has been committed. And then I will speak about another optimization, which is optimize the stack trace recording which is done in El Green, and this is not committed yet, and we will examine what, uh, why. So massive execution tree, quick reminder, it maintains a heap profile, and this heap profile associates the allocation stack trace with the allocated memory size. And so for each allocation, what does Massif do? So it has to get the stack trace and it has to insert it in X3 if this stack trace is not yet present. And then it has to add the newly allocated size to the stack trace memory size. And um, after, because it has to be able to, when we do a free operation, retrieve this stack trace in order to decrease the memory used by this stack trace, it is adding the allocated block and the pointer to the stack trace uh, stored in X3 in an hash table. So malloc, we do this, and this as part of malloc is done so that when we do the free operation, we can retrieve the stack trace that uh, allocated uh, the memory so that we can decrease the currently allocated bytes by the stack trace. And so for each day allocation size, using this hash table, we subtract the allocated size that has just been released from the stack trace memory size. So this explains basically the massive algorithm uh, using uh, the, the current way it is done. So here I will explain more in detail how it works on this example where we have function main which is calling x, a, o and then x again and then you see x is calling y, y is calling a malloc. By the way you see it will be lost but that's not the point and a similar uh, 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 call, uh, call from uh, a calling B, B calling malloc, and then you have function O directly calling uh, malloc. So with such a call, we will end up with such an X3 in uh, Valgrin 3.12. So the way the tree is represented in 3.12 is quite classical. It is just you have a top node and then you have children. And uh, from malloc, if we see, for example, that main, the stack trace main calling A, calling B, that is called malloc, uh, this will be stored in the tree with pointer uh, in this direction. Now we also have to store pointer in the other direction because when we add the, the stack trace in the tree we will add it like this but when we will release when we will free the, the block which has been allocated by the stack trace we have in fact to, to, to start from here in order to, to decrease the size of all the blocks which are uh, we, of all the functions which are in the call stack. So this is a classical tree representation with pointers to children, but we need back pointers. So in, in Valgrin 3.12, we also have back pointer in the tree in order to go up and down in the tree. So this, the data structure, uh, again in 3.12, which stores this, is represented, is shown here on, on uh, uh, the screen. So we have the code address of such a, 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 a block, eh? so of a, a certain call uh, in the stack trace. So for example, this might be function A or might be function B or uh, might be main. is a program counter inside main or inside function A or inside function B. Then here we 
record for uh, the, uh, uh, so this in 3.12 terminology, this is an execution point, so one of these uh, uh, small square uh, rectangle that I present. And we saw here the size of this block and for the bottom Uh, execution point, so uh, the, the lowest uh, level in the tree, it is the size uh, for this precise stack trace. And so after, when we, if I go back to the previous thing, so here, these are bottoms uh, execution point, and we see here a non-bottom execution point. The size here will be the sum of the things which are pointing back at this uh, 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 at this execution point. And so after, we also need the uh, children, an array of uh, uh, a pointer to an array of pointer to children. And because each time we are adding a uh, new uh, um, Uh, a new stack trace, we might have to expand the number of children. Uh, here we have an array which is bigger than, uh, than needed, and so it's expanded from time to time. So this is the real number of children, and that's the max number of children we can add, because, for example, the size of this is doubled each time we reach something too, too small. So that's the data structure in 3.12. So massive snapshots, how are they implemented in 3.12 based on this, on this thing? So the, the massive uh, snapshots, they record the evolution of the allocated memory. We have the summary snapshot, total memory size, the detailed snapshot. In 3.12, a detailed snapshot is a trimmed down copy of the massive X3. So this data structure with, with pointers and so on, when massive takes massive 3.12 takes a, a snapshot, it is cutting bit and pieces of this tree. Effectively, what massive is doing is that the non-significant stack trace are aggregated. So if you use massive, you know that it will show you by default the stack traces uh, uh, which are significant with full details, but when a stack trace is allocated less than a certain percentage of the memory, it will regroup all that in what is called a non-significant stack trace. And when massive takes a snapshot, it will copy the X3 and then group together the things which are not significant in order to reduce the size of the snapshot. So the non-significant stack trace are aggregated in 3.12. And so uh, we have in fact, when we take uh, a, a snapshot, we have a parallel data structure which is used to store the snapshot. So we had execution point and here we have snapshot execution point which basically has things that we recognize. We have the number of children and a pointer to an array of pointer to children. Here, we don't need anymore this max number of children because this is a snapshot and it will not grow anymore. It will not change anymore. So we don't need to oversize this to, avo to avoid permanent reallocation like in the real original snapshot. And then we have here something which is for the non-significant part of uh, the, the snapshot execution point, which records uh, the things which are insignificant. So in 3.12, We are using a classical tree representation with bidirectional pointer, and then we have a kind of parallel structure which is uh, derived from the uh, full uh, X3 uh, snapshot. So the massive output msprint you recognize uh, here, and the production, uh, you, you see the structure of this matches uh, the data structure that we, have, that we have seen. Like for example, we have here 0.25% in one uh, place, which are below massive threshold. And basically this structure is just produced from the snapshot X3 data structure that I've explained the slide just before. So now this, I have quickly described how it worked in 3.12, and now I will describe what were the objectives for the new implementation. So of course, the first objective was to still support massive e-profiling. It would be a little bit sad that the new stuff would not support massive. So the other thing is I also wanted to have e-profiling reporting supported by other tools. So this is, I wanted to generalize the memory reporting. And 
a sub-objective of allowing other tools to produce memory report was that if we don't use the new feature in memcheck, for example, or Helgrim, I want to have no impact, no CPU impact or ultra minimal impact on tools. So if you don't use the new X3 functionality with memcheck, memcheck is not, not impacted. So we want to have it also generalized. So we want to have this new functionality usable for more data than only the allocated memory, like what we have seen this morning. Uh, we can use it for the number of blocks, for the total freed blocks and so on. So it's more, when we look at memory reports, it records more, it can, it can record more than just the allocated bytes, but also for totally other types of data, like for example the leak, we can use the same data structure to record, uh, to represent leak information, or system call information like we've seen in the experimental syscall this morning. So uh, an objective was to generalize the data structure so that it could record something else than a size, massive Uh, execution point only records a size and the new implementation here can record variable things. So uh, uh, that's an example of uh, what, uh, what can be stored. Also I want to have more output format, so the Massif 3.12 only produce the uh, execution tree in Massif output file and one objective was to output the same kind of data but in a kcache green call, green format. So all this has led to implementing the X3 concept as a new module, pub tool X3.h, which is of course usable by Massif, but it is now also usable by other tools. So in 3.12, the execution point data structure that we saw was specialized for Massif and was part of Massif, and the new pub tool X3 is part of Margin Core and can be used by other tools and for other objects. Finally, I also want to reduce the memory usage uh, 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 by, uh, for the data structure, because if we want to use it for more things in main check tools and green tools, or for example for syscalls and record more data, it's nice to be able to have less memory use uh, by, by this data structure. And final objective is <coughs> that you should use less memory, you should use less CPU, and that's uh, not always by the So, how did, we, how did we look at this? How, 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 how did I try to, to achieve this, form, this, uh, uh, this objective? So, the first observation is that many tools, namely when check and read, they already record a stack trace for each allocation. And this stack trace is recorded as an exe context. An exe context it is a stack trace, but this stack trace is stored in a hash table and it has an EQ, exe context unique ID, which is an So an exe context, once we create one, it is stored in a dictionary of exe context, this are shared, and never disappears. So it's a dictionary where during run, all, all, we always add exe context to the exe context dictionary, we never remove. So they are added to the arch table, never removed. And so the idea is that the tool X3 will reuse the exe context to sort the X3 stack traces. This is what allows Menchek and Elgrim to use its tree without incurring additional costs during, let's say, normal operation, because the exact context are there, they are created in any case, and so can be used for other things. Some other observation about application behavior, which is helping to produce uh, 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 an optimized version. Most applications are doing a lot of calls to malloc and free, and most applications exist only once. Uh, I, don't mean, I don't mean that most that you have some applications that exist twice. Uh, what I mean is that some applications do not exist. <laughs> so most applications exist once. So massive reports, uh, the reporting, and more generally all its based reports that we want to do, they are also the termination time. And so what is nice if you want to reduce the CPU usage is to decrease the CPU that we spend 
when we do mammography and push this CPU as much as possible to the report inside. Uh, at the time we do the report, so emulation of when we are we, we, uh, uh, when we are to the report. So PIP tool X3.h minimize the work for mammography or more generally, minimize the work which is done when you are recording an event during the run. So first, one thing to uh, uh, optimize the CPU is it only maintains the data for the link is key nodes. Massive 3.12, each time it was adding uh, 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 some, it was allocating a block, it was increasing the size in the link execution point, and then was always propagating that up to the tree. And the new implementation doesn't do that, it only stores associated to the exact context the, the, uh, the, the data which is being recorded, so for example, it increases the number of allocated bytes for each mallet. So the additions that we have to do in order to represent the, the, the in order to do the massive reports for the KKR grid report, which is main has allocated 20 megabytes, because it has for the F1 that has allocated 50 megabytes and F2 that has allocated 5 megabytes. The additions to say that main has allocated 20 megabytes. We don't do that when, when we do value free. We do that when we produce reports. So how is the data structure looking like in 3.13 as yet? So the basic idea is we have an array of data. So the first difference compared to the execution uh, uh, point that we have seen with this uh, massive 3.12 is that the data is a simple, so the, the, when we store the data, it's a simple array which says here is a number of allocated bytes, here is a number of allocated bytes, this is a number of allocated bytes. And this is associated with exact context using two other arrays. So you remember an exact context as an EQ, uh, 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 a unique identifier, which is an integer multiple of four. So here, we have here an, an, uh, an array which is storing pointers to exact context. And how do we know when we have an exact context where it's stored? We have here another array which is used as, uh, 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 as a table to retrieve the offset <coughs> in this array and in this array where the data is stored. So imagine, for example, that we have uh, uh, various uh, uh, exact contexts. And so we have maybe an exact context which has an EQ which is uh, uh, which is uh, for, uh, sorry which is eight. So eight is the unique identifier of the uh, uh, of an exact context. We divide this by four, and then we obtain two. And this two is the we will record the offset in this array and this array where is where we store the pointer to the exact context and the data. So this array divided by 4 AQ to X AQ. So X AQ is a new, unique uh, exact context uh, identifier, which is in fact the offset in this X3 data structure. So the typical word for an allocation using this data structure is to get a stack trace and search in exact context in the hash table. And this is part of a standard module of Python. And so, a small note is Menchek and Elgri, they already have the exact context. So, it's not need to do a new stack trace because, in any case, Menchek and Elgri are already recording a stack trace for each allocation and a binary code also. So, for Menchek and Elgri, there is no additional unwind which is needed to be done. Then we obtain the uh, new XAQ, so the offset in this data structure by indexing in this array the AQ of the exact context divided by 4. And then after, when, when we have retrieved this of the offset in this array, we can just add the, the data that has just been allocated to this part. Of course, these arrays, they start with a small size, and then they are responded uh, 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 if, if needed. So if we have new exact context which are, uh, which are uh, which have an EQ bigger than this, we will reallocate this array, and similarly, these arrays will also be allocated. So you can see, in fact, that this is a sparse array, because not all entries are used, 
only the Excel context to charge it. It used by a discrete. We have an entry here. We, uh, this uh, avoids that these arrays are spam because this would contain a lot more data. This is bigger. So this is a simple integer. That's a pointer and two integers. And this is variable size data, which depends on the reason for which you are using the disk. If it is memory, you can have five, six data like this this morning, the number of bytes, blocks, and so on. And if it is uh, syscalls, uh, if you would uh, uh, enrich the, the syscall, it's three, it might be a lot more data depending on the disk. So it's, uh, it's relative. So then, based on this one, we implement snapshots. We implement snapshots, but it's very easy. In fact, the only thing we need to copy is to copy the data array. Because all the rest, the array of exact context and this array, we can be shared between snapshots. And so that's a big change compared to what Massif had. Massif had two data structures, one data structure for, let's say, the live, uh, the live execution tree, which was full and contained all the stack trace. And then it was copying the complete structure, truncating some bits and pieces in order to reduce the memory uh, uh, used by the snapshot to the relevant part. And that was needed to effectively not use too much memory. But here, because the only thing we have to save is the data, in fact, a, a big data snapshot, we don't have to truncate uh, the, uh, let's say, not significant part. We can just copy copy the data So this snapshot uh, and the X3, the active X3 can be output in massive and call green or call green format as I explained. So the output call green take and green format is very simple. We scan the exact context in the X3, we output each caller call in pair, we output the data image from the last pair and it's finished. So to output the call green format is really, is really easy. So for the output the massive uh, to, to be able to output a massive format was a, a slightly more complex. So this is the algorithm which, which is used to output an X3 in a massive level. So the first thing is that we have to store the X3 exact context by their uh, array of uh, uh, call form. So what we want is to, if you see for example at dead zero, we want to group together, in, 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 we want to store and act together all the, the exact context which have the same program counter at dev zero. And then inside the, the exact context which have the same program counter at dev zero, at dev one, we will send, we will also at dev one, so then by the, the same program counter. So in other words, we have at level zero uh, a thing sort of program counter, and then at level one, in the, in the subgroup, uh, which has the same program code, we will there also again store by program code. So this sorting is CPU costly, but in fact, this is also not <coughs> really dependent on a snapshot because the order of the exact context will always stay the same uh, if it is for one snapshot or another snapshot. So this is computed once when we need it, and then it is kept there and maybe updated if new exact context uh, were done. Then after, when we have sorted this, when we have been desorted array, then we output the exact context group recursively. So uh, we, we define the, exact, the sorted exact context at depth D in subgroups which have the same IP, as I explained, and which have the same parent. And then for each group, we add the value of its exact context. By the way, here is the place where we are doing the additions. So we only do the additions up in the tree, if you want, when we produce a report. So if you call malloc tree, malloc tree, malloc tree, malloc tree, massive tree point well was add, 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 uh, 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 subtract, 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 add, 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 so, and here, with the new implementation, we just do uh, add, uh, subtract, add, subtract, at one single place, rather than to go completely up in, in the tree. So this is one, one, one thing which makes uh, this CPU more, uh, uh, so this uh, uh, better for CPU. So when we have for each group, when we have added the value of all the exact context member of this group, we sort the group by total size, because a massive output is sorted, the bigger group at the beginning and the group has been allocated less hard. And so for each group sorted by total size, we output the collision, the total, and then we recurse. 
we only put the example text of the group that are one after this uh, uh, n so. So then I managed to, to uh, put the algorithm on one slide, but if you look at the code, it doesn't fit on one page. Right? It's, uh, uh, So some stats measurements uh, based on uh, uh, this. So uh, first, what is the size of the new XP module? So this has added about 1,400 lines of C code, and uh, uh, so source comments and so on included, and uh, uh, slightly more than 400 lines of uh, .h, which is kind of indexed to the new XP module. Massive, the size of massive code has decreased, 500 lines less. <coughs> and now what is interesting is to see how much code we have to write in order to have a tool using the new module. And an example, LG, in order to have LGREEN be able to produce a memory report and also uh, respond to VGBD command to output uh, an XP, it's 42 lines of code. So you see, by doing a module here, which is more code than we had before, we have it usable by other tools with a very small amount of additional, uh, uh, additional code. And we have, of course, additional functionality because it is more general, or it can be optimized before. So now some real-life performance measurements. So this uh, has not been measured on this laptop, but on a very fast machine, so called GX uh, core. Uh, uh, and uh, I did this measurement with uh, uh, an ADA application, which uh, I did in my work. So it's a graphical map application, which is uh, starting up, loads a lot of data, and then with this thing, I did a refresh and then tests. So it's this uh, it's doing 2.5 million of malloc and half a million pre. And we have in total in this application 85,000 different allocations that trace, 35,000 different P stack trace, and average stack trace, uh, uh, stack trace size of 24 trace. And so this is to show a nice picture. So this is the, the, the application which has started and we just showed some what. Uh, and if we would show all the uh, objects that have been loaded, then uh, it would. Uh, so this is all the objects which are loaded and then put on the map. Of course, all operators are usually not showing that amount of uh, objects, but it was just to show that this was not doing a, a, a lot of uh, These are all uh, the iron homes, uh, the waypoints, the navigation points, the routes, and so on used by the flights, uh, uh, the air space, the control air space. So it's uh, the whole structure of the, uh, of, uh, let's say, the air, the air traffic. So what is the performance impact of the X3? So massive tool 3.12, how did we uh, change when we went to 3.13? So first, the massive uh, needs to have its own data structure, and now the X3 has its own data structure. So in total, for this application, we went from 327 megabyte of bulk green memory to 151 megabytes. And CPU, this application was running 28 seconds and now runs in 30, 30 seconds. So you can, I, I explained that uh, this morning that you can also go with that to this produce X3 memory report for a check. Alloc just gives the uh, uh, currently allocated memory. So what is the overhead of using X3 memory before Alloc? Well, easy during, during run, if you do this, no, no impact, there is no additional impact, zero impact. And of course, if after we have to produce when we end up the XP file, so if for this application it's a file of 40 megabytes and it's produced in about 0.5 seconds. Fast, fast machine, and says Now if we do then check its key memory for full, which, we, which uh, 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 does more work because uh, it has to while it runs, reports a little bit more information, so this has an impact during run. So it's, neg it's a neglectable impact during run because I have explained the example text is already captured, and the only thing which has to be done is a few indexing in this array and then do some, some additions. So it is it was a, even very difficult to measure what was the real impact because the variation between runs was higher than, than what I did. So it's maybe one person, two person. 
the x cube prime for the e of name of the equal to is bigger because we have more even. It's 120 megabytes produces about 0 0.3 seconds. No, note uh, that the massive file will be a lot bigger because massive uh, 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 massive file format does not have any uh, compression features that the Fourier format has. So conclusion about X3, X3 modulates easy to use for different data. You can use it for memory report, deep reports, and I will discuss one of these days. And then we have more tools that can produce each or files. Massive is faster, use less memory. And so this is a successful optimization and it was done. Okay, now let's switch to the other optimization. Uh, which is not committed, and that's n grid history level equal to. So this uh, parameter to n grid tends n grid to record two, to report two stack trace for a rate condition. It reports the current conflicting access and the previous access. And this is an example. This is the current access, and that's easy to obtain because we are n grid just detects a rate condition, so it just unwinds and has this, this stack trace. But it has to tell uh, the stack trace, when we do this, of the previous stack trace, which has accessed this memory block. We can have a lot of these uh, stack trace. If you have 10 threads which are playing, maybe a lot of them have access uh, a lot of memory. And so we have to record, uh, record a lot of stack trace uh, to report uh, this error. And the idea was to optimize, to optimize this. So, as I explained, history level equal to implies to record and store a stack trace for many read or write instructions. I say many, not all, because there are some optimization in a grid for reading the trees in the same thread sequence. Basically, a grid has to see the coordination between threads, and we can say between two coordination, we call this a segment. And as long as you are inside the same segment, you, we might optimize uh, the recording and not necessarily record all the stack trace for all access to the memory. So the banking stack trace unwinding is very optimized, but it's still costly. Julian has done some measurement, I think, two, one to two weeks ago, to, to evaluate the cost of the unwind on the uh, 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 x8664 and to unwind one level of a stack trace, so for example, to a main point A, B, C, to see that, to, 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 to detect that C was called by B. This is unwinding one trace, and this cost about 220 instructions. So, so remember that we might have to record a stack trace for a lot of reads and a lot of writes. So it means that if you want to record a stack trace for one read, you have one instruction, and then you might, if you record eight trades, you might have to execute something like 2,000 instructions, but only to do the unwind. You know, after you still have to store it somewhere. So you see, L green is it's creating a heavy activity and it's storing a lot of these stack traces. So, what is the cost of this history level equal to? So if we again, I use my my graphical application, which is a multi-threaded application, by the way. With history level equal to dot, it runs in 46 seconds. With approx, which just records the two, the segment start and segment end of the race condition, it's almost the same cost because that's only when we have thread synchronization that a, a, a stack trace has to be recorded. And when we, we use history level equal to full, we have about 73 seconds, so significantly more. With this application, we have about 120 million stack traces of eight trades that have to be computed. And the measurement I did was 20 seconds of this additional time is used to compute the stack trace, the unwinding, and seven seconds is needed by the overhead of storing them somewhere in the specialized data structure. So we see that a lot of the cost of the history equal pool is the unwinding, and a part of the cost is the storage. So uh, recorded stack trace, let's take, for example, the, the program which, uh, uh, for which I have shown the race condition. We have here x plus plus, and it's an unprotected uh, 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 modification relative to the parent thread. And so the question is, how many recorded stack trace for this child function? So we have one access. As, do you have an idea how many stack traces are recorded by a grid for this? I see that Julia is thinking. I don't know the answer, but I'm sure the answer is too many. <laughs> uh, uh, not really, but uh, 
you might imagine there is one access, and so there will be one one stack stack table. No, not really. Here is the, the code, and then I have explained where we have a stack page which is recorded. So this function is called, and when we are calling this function, we have to write the return address to the stack, and this is a hide operation, and if it is a hide operation, we are recording a stack page. Yes, I think so. I, 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 I think this, this, is, this is correct. Then we push the FDP, so we hide on the stack, and there is no recording for this one, because as I explained, there are some optimization, and then we try to see that we have done uh, two hides uh, uh, at the same place uh, in the same segment, so they have a bunch of optimization which I do not understand, and so this one, we have a hide, but we have, we have no recording. So here, this is just moving register, no memory access, no stack A. If we have a hide on the stack, again, no recording optimized. Here, again, if we are recording the read to this, then we add one to the register, then we hide, and we record in the hide to this, and then after, we, we return, and here we have no recording because it's optimized, but here we are again, when we do the review, read from the stack, and we, we again record the read. So if you see for such a simple function, which is a few instructions, you can imagine you have to do its recording times a million mine y times 220 uh, instructions. So you can imagine why, though you can understand why a green runs somewhat slower than a big run. So observation about stack case, many instructions, most instructions, in fact, we only change the top instruction form. So that's a nice observation to, to see, and that is the basic idea with which I have optimized the stack case recording. So the optimization idea is to cache the last computer stack case, and so if the cache stack case is valid, then the new stack case is the cache stack case, but, and we just replace the last instruction point of the stack case by the current instruction point. Though of course, that's easy, but we have to invalidate the cache stack case sometime. So the cache stack case is invalidated by any instruction that changes the control flow. For example, call, return, etc. So where do we store the cache stack case validity? The cache stack case validity is stored in a shadow register, because then green does not use them, I did use them, and I did decide to use the stack point a shadow register. So if it is zero, it means the cache stack is invalid, and one, the cache stack is valid. So it is set to one when the runtime of a green a stack case, and then at instrumentation, at, at instrumentation, when we instrument the code, easier to say like that, then the instrumentation adds uh, a sign of zero to the shadow stack point for any intermediate representation exit kind, which is different of uh, boring. Boring means just go to the next instruction. Anything else is a kind of jump, and a kind of jump means that we can't just is the last instruction point, so we invalidate the cache stack So that's a basic idea, very easy to understand. Has everybody understood? Yes, so it wasn't easy to understand, right? So what is the cache stack case iterate for my application? So we are computing 20, about 20 million fresh stack case, and then we have, we have used the cache stack case with exactly the same IP, so it was a loop, in 19 million stack case, and then we have 78 million stack case where we have used the cache stack case and replace the last IP. The CPU time has decreased from 7.26 seconds to 58.8 seconds, so that's a really nice, uh, nice improvement. And so it's a nice improvement. It's an idea that looks simple, all regression tests are okay, and so why is this not coming? Ah, I should have finished the talk and I would not have to see. Why uh, to say why it's not coming? But it's good. I see that it's been good, so I'm be obliged to say why it is not coming. Well, first question is how is this patch tested? Well, it's tested with the regression test. And with a self test that I have had, the self test says for each stack trace, we compare a brand new freshly computed stack trace with a stack trace that I compute with this updated cache stack trace. And if they are the same, I'm happy, and if they are not the same, then there is probably a bug in what I have done. 
And so the regression based on the same SMPD, MPD called the cases which have, com which have compre complexified the idea. So first, the unwind errors are not self-repairing anymore. What does that mean? So the unwind algorithm is not always perfect. For example, it can give wrong results in some cases like function problem. In 3.12, and still in 3.13, because I did not copy this, a wrong stack trace is only shown to the user for a race condition in the prologue. But with this idea of caching, with the optimization idea, such a wrong stack trace can be used for the full function. If the full function is just a bunch of instructions like that, the wrong stack trace computed in the prologue will be used for the rest of the function, and that's possible. And so a consequence of this is that we need to have more correct unwinding at each instruction. By the way, when I tested this patch, I discovered some bugs in the unwinding or some limitation, and I did one or two improvements in the unwinding algorithm. So back to this patch, we have, we have improved the unwinding. Another thing which is very special for Valgrind is that we do unwind inside an instruction. That really bizarre, what does that mean? So let's see intermediate representation before optimization. So we have here uh, the push, uh, push uh, uh, instruction, and we see how this is translated. So we take the base pointer we assign to T0, we compute the stack pointer minus uh, A we assign to T1, we assign the new value to the stack pointer, and then we store uh, uh, T0 in every P, and then we go to the next instruction. So this is a, a bit more instrumentation. After instrumentation, each write might have additional calls to help us, to help us, which have to do an unwind. So this, this thing, we have to unwind, compute the fresh stack trace, maybe if it was not in one data, and here, we are in fact in the middle of an instruction. We have already changed the stack pointer, but the instruction pointer, the program pointer is still the, the, the thing. So we have unwind information in the debug info, but the unwind information describes what to do here or what to do there. It doesn't describe what to do in the middle of something being done. And that is somewhat annoying. Again, not really impacting 3.12. So this kind of thing push unlikely to have a race condition there. But if we reuse this stack trace for the rest of the function just in the last IP, it might be conformed. So to see, I have added a feature which is, I have added properties to instruction, which in the case of fix up the stack pointer. I need to mark the push, push like instruction with a fix up property. And then the generated helper calls, when it sees I'm on a, an instruction which has this fix up property, will automatically fix the stack pointer so as to, to, uh, to redo the addition, which, uh, which uh, compensate for the fact to be in the middle of the instruction. So here, when the, the, at the instrumentation time, we, when this has been marked as fix up SP, then the generated code here we call the same kind of helper, but indicating that the fix-up has to be done. So invalidate cache stack trace, another problem. Reminder of the simple invalidate ID, instrumentation has put uh, uh, stack, uh, cache stack valid at the end of the block for everything different from foreign. Well, the small problem is that some code instructions do not give an exit instruction because some codes are somewhat inline by the boundary chip. So for this, again, the idea is to mark the instruction with a call property, and then again, at instrumentation time, if we have a call property, we will, we will add an invalidation. So this is an example where we have two properties added to the instruction, a call property and a fix up property, because this call queue suffers from the two problems I have described. And so we are here calling the fix up, and we have added here an invalidate of the cache uh, stack trace. Self-test subtility, sometimes the self-test detects a difference between the threshold one and the updated from cache stack results. So the self-test says, here there is a bug, because Lgreen 3.12 would compute this, and the cache stuff computes that. Well, sometimes the unwind is incorrect, because what I have discovered here 
that, for example, missing fits up in the middle of instruction by green tree point web also suffers from that. So compute the whole stack trace, and for all the instruction where we have a fix up, in fact, the stack trace computed by N green was wrong, but this was not a big problem because it was fixed. So the cache stack logic in this case produces a correct result. And now, in the self test, I have added some logic to detect the case where the new implementation is better than the previous implementation. So, um, now uh, uh, I have run the regression test and self test, and I think, to my knowledge, that on x86 and x86 is for B, I think this is all okay, and the self test detects that all is okay except the known case where it is better than the previous implementation. But the state of what the platform is completely unknown. So should I commit this engine optimization to not too sure because we need to somewhat change uh, uh, a little bit of text to have these properties and uh, it's untested on some other platform. So maybe I could commit with a command line option to enable this label list optimization. We need to see if before commit we should not validate all the platform. And maybe we have to change a lot the approach because Maybe the property concept that I have added, maybe it could be useful to help for it on difficult platforms. Again, I don't know everything in this area, but I understood that on four PC and ARM, for green has some difficulties. And maybe using this kind of uh, uh, property might help for green, and then we should do something more general. And so maybe we need a tool independent module, pub tool efficiently track all stack changes dot H, maybe another name. Uh, to use a word like a dream called dream and so on, rather than this rather specialized end dream optimization. So conclusion, nice optimization can often be derived from very simple observation, both for the massive stuff and uh, for the end dream. Uh, some optimization, however, are not that simple, like we've seen with end dream. So is it okay to add this complexity? Well, for massive, it was really clear, yes, because it was additional complexity but usable by all tools, and so it's a benefit. But so if we have additional complexity in two reusable modules, that it's relatively clear that it would be good for me. But we have, when we have various bits of logics which are involved in the mean and green and so on, to do more or less the same, it is not that clear to me that, uh, that this is uh, uh, nice to commit, at least not without discussing it a little bit more in depth. So for green, I will explain some complex logic to maintain a stack trace. And green would have a different partial logic to maintain a stack trace, and that's very important. Voila, so we will have a time for this time. Some questions? Will it be possible to uh, expand the concept of having um, an unbound stack trace, but have point of So if you refer from a function, most of your stack trace that you had in the function is still valid, right? Yes. So why, why wouldn't you keep that around for, for, for a future stack trace? Yes, it's an idea to look at. In fact, as far as I understand, that's, I think, what Cold Green tries to do. It tries to understand what's happening to the stack trace and maintain it on a permanent basis. But uh, I don't know too much the problems that Cold Green uh, as uh, maybe Julian knows more about the difficulty, but on some platform at least it's difficult. Maybe on the x86 platforms we could do this relatively easy. Not, I'm not sure. But yes, it's it's one of the possible ideas. Another idea is because these eight stack trades, the, the trades are often the same except the last one. An, another idea I had was to in fact store only once the common thing and only have a pointer to the eight uh, stack trace and an additional thing that he replace the last one so it would increase the memory. So yes, this type of approach might open the door to other optimization, but the question is should we invest more in this approach or should we invest on uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, nice uh, new, new module uh, here that, that we, we, we should maybe uh, but yes, what you suggest is, is clearly some possibilities. Any other question? You yeah. still have five minutes at least. So, uh, Sorry? 